Okay, thank you. Uh, so this is a joint work with uh, my collaborators at Brain and DeepMind, uh, Sam Schoenholtz, Patrick Riley, Oriel Vignoles, and George Dahl. So I first wanted to begin by just motivating machine learning for virtual screening. So when chemists are designing new drugs and materials, they're, they're searching a practically infinite space of, of potential molecules. And so they, they just don't have time to synthesize every molecule. And they often rely on computer simulation to uh, narrow down like promising candidates. And so this is a really uh, uh, important potential application for machine learning. Uh, there's a growing number of large data sets of molecules. Uh, and so as, as you can imagine, as we design better machine learning models and get more data, we can design models which can predict if molecules are toxic to humans or whether they bind to the given protein, which is what you would do for drug discovery, or predict quantum properties of molecules, which, which are also used in uh, material design uh, and new drugs. Okay, so uh, in our work, we're gonna view molecules as graphs in three dimensions. So that means that the nodes of our graphs are gonna be the atoms of the molecule, and the edges of our graphs are gonna be bonds plus spatial distance information. So, so for many applications, we will actually have a 3D orientation of a molecule, and we encode that in the graph by the pairwise distances between pairs of nodes. And so this means that our graphs are fully connected because of the spatial distance feature. And so, since we're viewing molecules as graphs, when we started this project, we, we naturally looked at previous work on machine learning on graphs. And there's sort of two main categories of uh, previous approaches. So, so one involves feature engineering. And uh, so this is primarily targeted towards chemistry. There's, uh, this is not an exhaustive list, but there's, there's many different hand-engineered featureizations of molecules that people use to feed into standard machine learning classifiers. And on the right, there, there's a number of neural network-based approaches. Uh, some of these are applied to chemistry, some of these are just applied to more general problems where the input is a graph. Uh, but what unites these nine different papers is that these are all neural networks that are invariant to graph isomorphism. So what that means is you can feed in uh, two isomorphic graphs and the networks give the same output. Uh, another way to say that is you can reorder your vertices and your network is invariant to, the, to that order. And, and so we, we looked at uh, the, this prior work and we found that, that they're all actually very similar to each other. And, and so our main contribution is actually to unify these nine uh, different papers into a unified uh, family. And so we introduced this uh, mathematical framework which we call message passing neural networks which generalize all of this prior work. Okay, so what is a message passing neural network? So the input is under directed graph G you have node features and you have edge features, which in general are vector valued. And the output, uh, at least in our setting, is a graph level target. Uh, and again, the important property of these models is this, this output is invariant to the order of vertices. So here I just have the same graph and all I've done is relabel the vertices and, and the message passing neural network will produce the same output for each graph. Uh, I should mention you can also do node level targets and edge level targets uh, and this family works as well in those settings. Okay, so message passing neural networks, they, they do computation in two phases. They, there's a message passing phase followed by a readout phase. And so during the message passing phase, you have hidden states at each vertex in your graph, and you're gonna update these hidden states over T message passing steps. And these are defined in terms of message functions and update functions. So here I'm just going to illustrate uh, how to update the hidden state of this yellow vertex, uh, H1. So you first are going to use your message function to compute messages going from the neighbors of, of vertex one into H1, or into vertex one. So, uh, and so the message function is just generally defined as, it's some learned differentiable function that takes as input the, uh, the source node, the target node, and the, the edge between them. And it outputs a, a message vector. Okay, so we compute these two message vectors, and then we're going to aggregate them by summing. And then we, we take that aggregate message vector and we apply our update function to update the hidden state at vertex one. And so that was basically a single message passing step to update a single node. Uh, in general, we, you do message passing for all nodes in parallel. And so you're gonna compute messages along every edge going both directions using your message function. And you're gonna apply the same message function for all pairs of nodes. Uh, so after you compute your message vectors, you again aggregate by summing, 
uh, and then apply your update function to each vertex uh, in parallel. And you, again, you're gonna use the same update function at each vertex. And so that was a single message passing step. You're gonna do this t times, uh, where t is a hyperparameter. And so again, you take your, your new hidden states, you compute messages again, aggregate and apply your update function. Okay, so that was the message passing phase. Uh, after you do t message passing step, you then read out. So during the readout phase, you basically forget all the edge information, and you just take your final hidden states at your nodes, and you feed that set of final hidden states into your readout function. Uh, and as long as your readout function is invariant to the order of nodes, the output of your message passing neural network will also be invariant to the order of nodes. And so this, gives a, this framework gives a new perspective on previous work. <clears throat> and so as one example, uh, there's a paper that appeared at NIPS in 2015. Uh, it's a great paper. Uh, it's uh, convolutional neural networks on graphs. And uh, on the left is one of these hand-engineered molecular featurizations that I mentioned before. And, and, and their model is viewed as a, a deep neural net like relaxation of that featurization. But if you view this, this network as a message passing neural network, it, it greatly simplifies. And so their message function from W to V is just the concatenation of the hidden state at W uh, and the edge between the, the two vertices. Update function is also quite simple. It's uh, you just take your aggregate message vector, multiply by a matrix that depends on the degree, and apply nonlinearity. And the readout function basically aggregates over all nodes and all previous time steps. Okay, another paper, uh, Interaction Networks, another really cool paper that introduces a neural network that uh, basically models a physical system. Uh, where you have objects and relations between objects. Uh, as a message passing neural network, it reduces to, the, the message function is just a neural network that takes the input, uh, the concatenation of the source node, target node, and edge. Update function is another, is another neural network, and the readout function is a third neural network that takes as input the sum. Uh, one last paper I just want to mention, uh, gated graph neural networks, period ICLR 2015. Uh, another really cool paper, um, so their message function, uh, so this paper assumed that the edges in your graph have discrete edge labels. And so they, they embed each edge label as a matrix. And so the message from W to V is you look up the edge label between W and V, uh, apply that matrix times the hidden state at W, and, and that's the message. Update function is a GRU. Uh, <clears throat> and the readout function uh, basically aggregates over each node independently and sums. Uh, I just wanted to uh, focus on this one because the model that we apply to chemistry is gonna be motivated by this one. So um, an important thing about this uh, paper is they use the same message and update function each time step. And uh, we're gonna do the same in, in our work and, and we find that allows us to use a larger model um, and, and get better performance. Okay, but, but each of those nine papers that I mentioned basically just defines a different message function, a different update function, a different readout function. Okay, uh, so back to chemistry. So the, the application that we're interested in is, uh, involves density functional theory. So this is a numerical method for approximating many quantum properties of a molecule. Uh, the, the inventor, uh, at least one of the inventors, uh, won the Nobel Prize uh, in chemistry for it. It's responsible for two of the top 10 most cited papers of all time. Uh, and it's, it's widely used because it's a good balance of speed and accuracy. <clears throat> and so it does a bunch of math to approximate the wave equation, uh, but uh, an important thing is that it's, it's still too slow for large searches. So if you wanna run DFT on a small organic molecule, uh, it'll take a, a, around an hour. And for larger molecules, it can take a day. And so if chemists wanna search uh, you know, over a space of a million molecules, this is prohibitively expensive. So that motivates our application. We're, we're gonna predict DFT with a message passing neural network. And the upshot is we're gonna get very high accuracy to DFT, but our, the inference time of our networks is gonna be 300,000 times faster than running DFT itself. Uh, and so we do this on the QM9 data set, which consists of 130,000 small organic molecules. There are 13 different regression tasks computed by DFT. And so we're gonna predict each task uh, with uh, using a mean squared error. And just an example of two tasks, uh, one is the energy of the highest occupied molecular orbital, which I'm not a chemist, but the, the chemists tell me that's like the most reactive electron in your molecule. 
And uh, another t task is like the heat capacity of the molecule. Okay, so the, the actual MPNN that we applied to this uh, is motivated by gatorgraph neural networks. Uh, so that paper assumed that there were discrete edge labels. We have vectored valued edges, and so we sort of did the most natural thing, which is to map this edge vector by a neural network to a matrix, and then apply that matrix to the, the source node when you're computing the message. And we're gonna use the same update function, which we found trained really well, which is a GRU. And then for the readout, uh, we felt that something more general than just summing nodes and feeding that sum to a neural network uh, is to use the, the set to vec model that's defined in the order matters paper of Vignoles et al. And I, I won't go into the details of that model, but it, loosely speaking, it uses differentiable soft attention to uh, define a, a, a way to do computation on sets. Um, and so it's a sort of a general way to uh, learn uh, an order invariant function of, of your set. Okay, so we apply this to QM9. How do we do? I, I don't expect everyone to digest all the numbers in this table, uh, but uh, so the numbers are proportional to the mean absolute error of the models. <clears throat> we compare against five, the five different hand-engineered featureizations that I mentioned before. In the middle, we compare against three different message passing neural network baselines, and uh, so we we're able to get state-of-the-art on all 13 tasks. On average, we're a factor or two better than the, base, than the best baseline. Uh, and the important thing about these numbers is any number that's less than one means that we're predicting that target to within chemical accuracy. So what does that mean? So we're, we're basically predicting 11 out of 13 targets to within chemical accuracy. Uh, so this is a qualitative description of that statement. Uh, so suppose this black line is the actual target, if you like did a very precise experiment in the lab to measure. Chemical accuracy is sort of a gold standard in chemistry. It's roughly defined as uh, sort of like proportional to standard deviation of a really precise experiment. So DFT, uh, for many targets, not actually even within chemical accuracy of the target, but our model in blue is predicting DFT to within chemical accuracy. So basically, we're overfitting to the DFT calculation. And uh, this is why we believe future work should focus on uh, either more accurate simulations or more varied uh, molecular spaces. Okay, uh, so just to wrap, wrap up, uh, future work, uh, train on more complicated molecular spaces, do more accurate simulations. Um, material science has infinite periodic graphs, which would be uh, really cool to try. And an important one is to develop models which are able to generalize to larger graphs than appear in the training data. So right now, if we train on graphs of size at most 30 and test on graphs of size 31, uh, we, we don't do very well. Okay, and that'll do it, so questions? Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so my, my, my question is, you have good results with DFT, right? Mm -hmm. uh, have you tried actually to apply GANs or something to generate uh, like a new substances? Like, um... uh, no, but David Duvenod has a lot of really cool work applying VAEs to uh, basically create a generative model for chemical space. Uh, but we, we haven't tried it personally, but okay. I, I would look up uh, some of his work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs>